of the Selma to Montgomery march, we had a great opportunity to cross paths with many uh, individuals, uh, many of the uh, martyrs, many of the, the, the shakers and the movers of the movement in the uh, 65 time frame. And I met Miss uh, Boynton, Amelia Boynton Robinson. At that time, she was 103. Uh, I got to be in her presence with the president in Selma. Uh, she was in Montgomery on at least two occasions, and also uh, we had an opportunity in Tuskegee to be with her. Surely if Rosa Parks was the mother of the civil rights movement, uh, Miss uh, Boynton had to be a sister or a daughter or some um, person, and she passed away uh, at the age of 104. And there was a great tribute by President uh, Obama, but I wanted us to remember her this morning in such a way as she has changed the lives of so many, not only here in the central part of our state, in the state of Alabama, but certainly the entire world. Well remembered for the incident uh, on Bloody Sunday, but even before that, in the 20s, she was out trying to get her mother in Savannah, Georgia, registered to vote, even in the 20s. And so if we could, just take a moment and, in your own way, let's just remember the uh, icon of that movement and keep in your thoughts and ideas uh, about as we move towards December and the 60th that we'll have on December 1st and December 2nd here uh, in Montgomery. Thank you. Well, today, we're going to do something uh, a bit different. Very seldom do we use this platform to talk about and encourage legislation that is bigger than just Montgomery. Now, we'll use this opportunity all day long to help the causes for Montgomery. But what we're going to talk about today certainly is about Montgomery but more importantly, it's about the entire state of Alabama. It's about a piece of legislation that, frankly, until we even started this conversation, I did not know about. But as I understood and read the intentions of that, I wanted to be a part of that because, frankly, without knowing about that legislation, we, for years, have been working on this obesity issue. And by inference, di diabetes and all of those that, impact our kids and our adults. I don't have to remind you that early on in our administration, we got named the most obese city, and that hurt our feelings. And we did uh, what everybody does. We appointed a health czar, and uh, Michael Burdell became that, but not only for Montgomery, but for the entire river region. And it has been really a, a successful endeavor. Uh, we've been awarded uh, awards for that. And you know, while the numbers are important, from a standpoint of the percentage of less obese people we have today, at the end of the day, um, we can claim 25 to 30, depending upon what area, thousand individuals that are less obese today than they were four years ago when we started this. And so today, uh, we, without knowing about this legislation, we've been for years using various incentive programs to encourage grocery stores and healthy food stores to locate in what I call food deserts, and we've been fairly successful. We've got Lee Wilcoxon with us today on Fairview Avenue, the Piggly Wiggly, the millions of dollars of expansion that he just had right there in the middle of a food desert, and we incentivize them. If you just go across the street down uh, about 100 yards, you'll have the Fairview Farmer's Market, where Ms. Brown was fixing to close her doors. Uh, because of the necessities of some of the finances at the state. But we came, had the opportunity to come in and marry it with a police presence there, and now we're going to have continued fresh food uh, there. Uh, take a gentleman out of Mississippi, a guy named Todd Val, who approached us a number of, of uh, months ago with Mac McLeod about opening a cash saver right in the middle of what we called a food desert, whether it be Robert Renfro, who took a piece of property that had been abandoned, uh, right behind uh, 
off of um, uh, in East Montgomery, uh, that he is now opening that store. And certainly, Eat South, a uh, downtown farm, has been uh, kind of the leader of all of this. So what we've been trying to do is to make sure that we put individuals and we put uh, organizations in grocery stores for the health side of the equation, but it's also economic development because any normal grocery store will have uh, 50 or so employees. Uh, if you're a grocery store or a supermarket, you're going to have over 100, and I'll bet you that uh, Lee uh, tells us you probably have in the 70 to 80, 80 employees uh, that have good, good jobs uh, all day long with that uh, endeavor. And so with that, we found out about a group called Voices for Alabama's Children, who has been leading the charge in this new act. It's called the Healthy Food Financing Act um, that uh, has been in the legislature now for some time. And I know there's going to be a push. And Jada uh, Schaefer, Voices with Alabama, if Jada, I'm, I'm looking for you. I can't find you. I know you're here because I talked to this. Jada, if you would come and talk a bit about the act and uh, what, uh, what we can do as citizens, and then we have one or two other individuals that will talk about the role that they're playing and the role that we all can play in trying to make, in, in this case, Montgomery and the state of Alabama uh, a more healthy place. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Strange, and thank you all for being here today. Um, Voices for Alabama's Children's mission is to ensure the well-being of all Alabama's children through research, public awareness, and advocacy. Um, this past legislative session, um, we worked with the Alabama legislature to introduce and pass enabling legislation for the Healthy Food Financing Act. Um, right now, more than 1.8 million Alabamians, including nearly half a million children, live in communities with limited access to fresh, healthy food. This lack of access to fresh, healthy food it has a negative impact on the health of children and families in both rural and urban Alabama which often leads to a litany of chronic health diseases. Alabama has the nation's highest rate of diabetes in adults and the highest rate of, third highest rate of childhood obesity. That fact is alarming. However, we have a solution. Improving healthy food access for all Alabamians will improve their overall health and general well-being, which will also help save the state money. In fact, if the state were to reduce obesity by 5%, by the year 2020, the state could save an estimated $3 billion in obesity-related health care costs. That's $3 billion we could save. Increasing access to fresh, healthy food is a key component to a comprehensive solution in combating obesity. As I mentioned earlier this year, Voices for Alabama's Children led a coalition that worked with the Alabama legislature to enact the Healthy Food Financing Act. The Healthy Food Financing Act incentivizes grocers and food retailers to locate into, in, into these communities. This critical piece of legislation puts, on, puts us on the path toward building a much needed infrastructure to help bring healthier foods closer to home for all Alabamians. To ensure the successful implementation and viable program, we encourage our state leaders to join Mayor Strange and voice their support for addressing healthy food access. And at this time, we'll bring Linda Lee from a, Alabama Academy of Pediatrics to join us. Thank you, Jada, and thank you, Mayor Strange. Um, I am encouraged to see so many of you here today in support of healthy food access, which is an issue that directly impacts our children. The Academy of Pediatrics has partnered with Voices for Alabama's Children in support of this initiative because it aligns with our mission of attaining optimal physical, mental, and social health and well-being for all infants, children, adolescents, and young adults in our state. There is a growing body of research that demonstrates that access to healthy food retail stores has a measurable impact on people's diet and health outcomes. We have the highest rate of adult diabetes in the nation and the second highest rate of high blood pressure in adults. By and large, these types of, di of obesity and diet-related diseases begin during childhood. We know that these obese children are 80% more likely to become obese adults than non-obese children, and over the course of a lifetime, health care costs for obese children are estimated to be at least three times higher than children who are not obese. These numbers are concerning to us on a state level because of their potential impact 
on the physical and economic health of our state. But many of our members see the day-to-day -day impact that the childhood obesity epidemic has on individuals and understand how improved access to fresh, healthy food can help reverse this troubling trend. And so I'd like to call on one of our um, members who has been very active in our chapter and is a past president um, of our chapter and a pediatrician here in Montgomery, Dr. A.Z. Holloway. He's got a bigger portfolio than that, too. <laughs> Thank you, Mia. Uh, thanks, Linda. And I'm happy to just stand here before you today and talk a little bit about uh, what, what I think are some important issues in making sure that children have fresh, healthy food. Um, well, you wonder why a pediatrician would be sitting up here talking about this, but a lot of times we're the first line uh, provider who works with our children and parents in the Montgomery area. And sometimes we're the only professional that the uh, family may see. And a lot of times over the years, I find myself spending more and more time talking about nutrition and mental health issues to our children and parents. I've been around this area probably about 35 years, and I've seen the, the pendulum for healthcare swing from when I first came, we were worried about undernourished children to where we are now that we're worried about obese children. So I think that uh, we do have a new epidemic that we have to address. Currently about 35% of Alabama children are overweight and about 18% are obese. But I think if you pull out those who are in lower socioeconomic groups, about 30% of our children in lower socioeconomic groups are obese. It's not unusual now for me to see a six-year-old who weighs over 100 pounds. It's not unusual for me to see a 15-year-old who weighs 300 pounds. Uh, and that's almost a weekly, weekly thing that we see. And we know that if you don't have access to fresh food and nutritious food, then good health is really out of reach. You know, one of the simple things that I try to tell my parents is five, three, two, one, five servings of fruits and vegetables, first thing. And of course, if you're, not, if you're in a food desert, where are you gonna get fresh vegetables and fruits from? Uh, one out of five high school students are obese. That's the third highest rate in the nation. And I know we're obsessed with football, but that's one, <laughs> one thing that we don't wanna be. We, wanna be. we don't wanna be number three in that rating. And we have to have a strategy to how we can address obesity. And one of the first things that we have to have is a, a fresh fruit available in all areas in our, in our city. Uh, that's why I'm in full support of this healthy food financing initiative. I think it's very important and one of the first keystones that we have to have and the CDC and the Institute of Medicine also said that one of the first thing that we have to do is try to encourage supermarkets to go into these des desert food deserts so that um, we can help counteract obesity. About 30% of our children in Montgomery and nearly half a million children in Alabama are in communities that would be considered food deserts. Food desert, for those who aren't aware, are just places where you simply cannot find fresh, healthy foods. If you go in an area such as these, you'll find plenty of fast food chains, but not much fruit, fresh, and fresh fruits and vegetables. So we have to continue to try to encourage, support this bill so that we can kind of try to eliminate the food deserts and begin trying to counteract our obesity problem here in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Mm -hmm. He has long been associated with the uh, River Region Health uh, Clinic there on the campus of Jackson Hospital, and he's been a, a great advocate uh, along the way. And, you know, we've talked a lot about some of the areas that we've also uh, done uh, in the food desert. Uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks we'll be able to announce one in downtown uh, Montgomery, which will actually be the third uh, place that we can have uh, good healthy Good, healthy food. We've got some a uh, couple of other participants that we want to call the microphone. Connie Dacus, uh, Connie, if you would come. Uh, this uh, lady not only is involved in this, come on, involved in this uh, as an instructor at ASU, but she's been on the leading edge of, of helping Montgomery do really good things. She was part of the team that went uh, and, and got us the All-American City Award. She's also helping us with smoke-free Montgomery. So this lady knows what she's talking about, so pay good attention to her. Thank you, Mayor Strange. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I've had the opportunity to work with voices, but I come to you basically as a member of the Alabama Obesity Task Force, the River Region Obesity Task Force, and the American Heart Association. All of these entities are very passionate to me, and I try to make that a passion for my students. So hopefully that's well um, 
put into place. But I joined a group of students in April in the Heart Association's National Walk. But what we did, we added a twist to that walk and we decided to see if we were actually in a food desert near the campus of Alabama State University. So our students walked in different directions and as they walked, they tweeted, they used Facebook, they Instagrammed to say exactly what they saw as they walked. And it was a little bit alarming and it was a difficult reality basically for me to face that downtown Montgomery and areas close to where we live, work, and serve could actually be considered a food desert. And the fact that two million Alabama residents, two million, you all, including nearly half a million of those are children, live in communities with limited access to fresh foods and vegetables. Um, and it's just disturbing to me. When you find a burger easier than you find a banana, Ooh. that's something to really, really think about and take to heart. And I know this is going to be challenging, as some of the individuals before me have said, that obesity has been one of our initiatives and we have to keep working on that. We aren't going to give up on it. And, and I'm so thankful, Mayor Strange, for your initiative today. But we can overcome these issues. And Montgomery leaders, like Mayor Strange, and also, young leaders are going to bring this to the forefront, and we will be successful. So at this point, I'd like to introduce one of my young leaders who has also been very passionate about the healthy food uh, access and definitely trying to eliminate those food deserts in our Montgomery community. Thank you. Good. She is talking about Jerry Crum. <laughs> Jeremy, if you would come. Did you tell me you were president of the student body? He's a modest guy. He's president of the student body at ASU and probably a participant in the walk. Yes, sir. Yeah, good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Crum. I'm a senior physical education major at the Alabama State University. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Dacus, and thank you all for allowing me to be here with you today. Today, I'm representing the voice of other college students at Alabama State University and other Alabamians who live in urban and rural areas with limited access to healthy foods. We all have so many issues that worry us. For me, it's midterms, finals, and finding a career. But none of us should have to worry about being able to purchase fresh, healthy foods close to home. During our walk, we were looking for things that should have been really easy to find, such as a pineapple or a potato. What we have found for us was that, and for so many other people who live in urban areas like ours, finding fresh, healthy foods can be very challenging. We've communicated what we found, or rather, what we were unable to find. On Twitter that day, and have continued using social media to express our support for healthy food access. Now, it's time for all of us to use our voices, online and in our communities, to communicate to our friends, neighbors, and leaders the importance of ensuring everyone in Alabama has access to fresh, healthy foods. Thank you. Jeremy, if you'll stay. Um, Jada, if you'll come. We have a proclamation that uh, I will not read in its entirety, but uh, a lot of the facts that are included in there uh, have already been stated. But uh, let me just read the last two lines. It says, uh, whereas healthy food financing uh, initiatives to provide economic incentives to healthy food retailers who locate in underserved communities have been, has been a successful policy solutions in other cities and states. Now, therefore, uh, Todd Strange, mayor of the great city of Montgomery, endorsed Alabama's healthy food financing initiative to incentivize healthy food retailers that locate in undeserved community, underserved communities, which will improve health outcomes of Alabama residents and promote a stronger economy for our communities and our states. If you could get those that need to uh, be in the photo op, we'll take this opportunity to sign a proclamation. And I am told that we're the first of the big city mayors that is in fact doing this. And uh, we have a meeting of our big city mayors coming up shortly and we'll take this and hopefully they will join in this as well. Lee, if you would come. In witness whereof I have hitherto set my hand and seal city of Montgomery to be offered this 27th day of August, 2015.
There you go, and I'll give it to you, Jeremy. How about that? Thank you. Congratulations, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, on a, on a uh, city note, let me be, be very specific as to the success. We talked about the 25 or 30,000 less obese people, but the, the city of Montgomery, about four years ago, started on this journey just with our own employees, the 2,500 or so employees, uh, because we were experiencing tremendous increases in health costs and, and total um, expense for health care uh, in, in our community. And our citizens pay that through our general fund. Well, we put in a ton of different uh, initiatives, the Smoke Free uh, initiatives, the, the healthy uh, screening. Uh, they even found out I was borderline obese and, you know, I started doing different things uh, along the way. But we have repeatedly found individuals that had heart issues, that had obesity issues, that had diabetes issues, and you name it. I'm just pleased to tell you that one of the reasons that we're in a better financial situation today than we were four years ago is this year, and I'm going to knock on wood because we've got another month to go, it looks like we will have something in the two and a half to three million dollars of savings in our medical health care account this year, whereas previous years we've been having one, two, and three million dollars of deficits there and so we can begin to pay back that's just what we can do when you put your minds to trying to get something accomplished and all this is is just trying to be a leader in the efforts that voices and many other organizations around are doing that so thank you for that and hopefully we can get some additional uh, people behind this uh, because food deserts are very severe in the state of Alabama well, we're on the health kick today. Um, we got another opportunity to burn some calories uh, along the way. Come Saturday morning, and if you've had your head under the rock, you're not aware of the fact that we're going to have a dragon boat race in Montgomery, Alabama. Andrew Szymanski is the king dragon. And, uh, Andrew, if you would come, I want to tell just a quick story. Uh, I told this the other night. Um, I met Andrew six years ago when he was uh, engaged by the, the uh, organizing leadership to really be the executive director of this dragon boat. And, and I promise you, we had no clue what dragon boat racing uh, meant. I told the story at AUM the other day when, when they first came to me with a, um, uh, an idea for raising money for charities, they were going to drop ducks, these little rubber ducks. Dawn remembers, going to dollar these rubber ducks off of the... Uh, yeah, I-65 bridge, and you would uh, buy this duck, in a way, betting on who was going to finish first due to the current and things like that. Well, we'd gotten a little ways down the road. We figured out somebody called us and told us that was not legal. That was gambling. <laughs> so we had to go in another direction. But dragon boats have really been uh, really important for us. It's given us some identity. Uh, it, it's a wonderful thing to do in late August on the riverfront. But more importantly, it's raised uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for charity Bridge Builders of Alabama and also the rebuilding uh, together uh, Central Alabama. So, Andrew, this is your opportunity to uh, get everybody down on the riverfront. And uh, when it's come time, I'll do the paddle up. Well, thank you, Mayor Strange. Thank oh, you, everybody, for being picture. here. What a great picture. What a great picture. Show me the picture. <laughs> We have the opportunity to come to his office and take a picture. Please, on your way out, grab one of our uh, re, uh, redesigned festival guides. These came out really, really well this year. Give you a good overview of what's going to happen on the day of schedule, entertainment vendors and stuff like that. But uh, first off, a lot of people have been asking us over the years why we couldn't move the festival from August to October or March. And this year, with the weather stays as good as it is, I have brought October to August. So we are going to have a beautiful day on the riverfront this year. And, uh, and trust me, after last year's uh, heat wave, we know, you know that we want to have as many people coming down to experience the festival as possible. This year we have done a lot to really invest into the public's um, enjoyment of the, of the races, but also the festival atmosphere. When you come down there this year, you're going to see a lot of new things. Number one is we have some unbelievably unique, um, eclectic vendors that are going to be a part of our um, event this year. 
Um, we have organizations uh, or companies like a uh, couple pops, popsicle companies coming down. We have some um, artisans, a lot of handmade and crafts work uh, type of entities. Really some people, some of those small businesses that are really kind of the heart of the kind of cultural movement here in the central Alabama area. Also, we're gonna have a lot of entertainment this year. We're gonna have a couple of concerts, a full one hour lunchtime concert by Captain Kudzu out of Opelika, who's making huge waves up there. Also to a local act, the, the Powell Brothers, who a lot of you see down at the rail yard, the exchange. And really just wanting to give people more entertainment, more things that they can enjoy on race day rather than um, just watching the races. Of course, our event, ever since the very beginning, has been a free event to the entire public. We have a children's village down there, inflatables, face painting, and of course we have the races on the water. One of the things we're really excited about this year is that this year for the first time we have seven teams participating um, either from Maxwell Air Force Base or the Air National Guard. And I'm excited we're gonna have a special guest on, on that day to present our military challenge trophy. Major General Leahy will be joining us on that day. And it really, I think one of the things that we've learned as this event has kind of moved forward is that the Montgomery Dragon Boat Festival and all of its participants, volunteers, and supporters it's really um, a good kind of slice of the Montgomery pie. And it also, at this time, I kind of want to take a moment to thank the mayor and thank the city of Montgomery. We have all sorts of businesses, community groups, um, different participants who participate in the festival, but we also have pretty, a, a large cut of the um, city who really helps us out, whether that's sanitation, parks and rec, riverfront facilities, special events, the mayor's office, police department, of course, a special thank you to the fire department who handles all of our safety. So really, just like we have all of these different diverse groups that um, participate in the festival, behind the scenes, we have almost every department of this city supporting our event, which allows it to be free to the public. And at the end of the day, the one thing that makes this event so special to me is that it is a fundraiser, and a lot of people forget that. Um, over the past six years and after this year, we're going to raise about $250,000 for two very worthy nonprofit organizations. One I have a close connection to. My first year in Montgomery, I actually landed in Montgomery because I did a year of service with the AmeriCorps uh, VISTA program. And I was working for Bridge Builders Alabama, which is a youth leadership development program for high school juniors and seniors. And it is a program that brings together students from all different high schools across six different counties, teaches them leadership skills, civic engagement, community service, and teaches them how to be young leaders. When I started with Bridge Builders back in 2010, there were about 80 students in the program. That program includes a one-week leadership conference, which is now held out at AUM. And those students give about 3,200 hours a year in service back to this city. Now, with the growth of the festival, that organization is our us as their primary fi uh, fundraiser has grown from about 80 students to 253. Rebuilding Together Central Alabama, an organization that does home repairs and home renovations here in the River Region, um, really an, a great way to understand what they're doing is they're making the necessary repairs to keep people in their homes. They're not rebuilding and building brand new homes. What they are doing is going into homes where people have had caved in roofs, broken windows, people who become disabled and need wheelchair ramps and, wheelchair, or, and uh, disabled access bathrooms. They're going in, we actually had a, a homeowner very recently who was sent to the hospital as a grandmother. She's living in a house uh, with her daughter her daughter's three children and her and one grandchild. And while they were out tending to the grandmother at the hospital, um, some thieves broke in and took all of the copper plumbing, wiring, and everything out of her home. So when they got back a week later, it was unlivable. And Rebuilding Together was there with the help of their volunteers to go in there, find the materials, and fund the, the, the renovations to make that house livable again. We all know how important it is to have a home that we can call our own, and that's what they are doing here. So with the growth of the festival, and, and while everyone's having a great time on Saturday, it's not just that we get to go out and have a lot of fun. It's not that we get to get competitive and compete against similar industries and people all over the city of Montgomery, but at the end of the day, this is a great example of what Montgomery does best, which is have a lot of fun for a good cause. And I just wanted to thank the city, the mayor, obviously the police and fire department have been a huge support of us over the past few years um, for being there for us and we are really excited it is going to be a beautiful day and we hope thousands of people show up it's going to be an absolutely gorgeous day down at Montgomery's Riverfront hey Andrew we don't like the first part of that story but we like the back the back part of that story I've asked uh, our two uh, chief uh, Ken uh, Bolin is uh, sitting in for the chief uh, he's over at this important conference so uh, Ken Bolin gets the opportunity to be in charge where he's going, and we know Chief Finley. If you guys would step over here, please. I'm going to tell another story very quickly 
because I know time is of the essence, but when, when uh, I was down there in the couple of years ago, uh, we had a fire team and we had a police team and we had a, a, some city teams. And then as Andrew said, we got a lot of military. And so uh, it, the elimination had taken place and it was the last uh, race. And I guess there are four teams uh, in the last race. There was a military team, there was a fire team, there was a police team, and there was an accountant team. And so I pulled the, the uh, fire and the police teams together. And I pointed over to the military and I said, now, I just got to tell you, I don't care if they win, but for God's sakes, don't let the accountants win. <laughs> and they didn't. But I just wanted us to get this good photo out with all of us together because this, uh, this is a great, uh, great organization. There you go. Okay. Can we do that? Does that work? Yeah. One, two, three. As the mayor's trophy now for the winner, <laughs> winning, winning team. Yeah, exactly right. Thanks, guys. Yes, sir. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Chief. Again, keeping with this uh, great uh, health theme, uh, we've got some opportunity coming up over Labor Day uh, in Montgomery. We got the R3 Labor Day run. Ron Max South uh, is here with us. He's the promotions coordinator. If you would come, Ron, and talk about the event, publicize that, and also talk about what you do um, in your other time and uh, what you represent and how this really does affect our community uh, more than just having a good fun running. Because I've heard of the 5Ks and I've heard of the halves, and I follow the I've never heard of an 8K. So this is what this is, 8K. <laughs> Thanks, Mayor, for this opportunity. And um, actually, I'm uh, wearing two hats today. I am the promotions coordinator and long-term, uh, long-time member of uh, the River Region Runners. Uh, formerly, it was the Montgomery Track and uh, Running Club back in the day. Um, I think um, both uh, the organizations I re represent, uh, in addition to the uh, uh, R3, the Road Runners Club of America, uh, which is uh, the largest uh, organization of uh, running clubs and oldest, uh, in the nation uh, that's been promoting uh, the sport of running since 1958. And um, the RRCA mission uh, closely mirrors what you've been talking about today. Um, not only the development of uh, community-based running clubs and events for people of all ages and abilities, not only for competition, but also for health reasons. Um, and when we talk about running, we're not just talking about running. We're talking about walking. Actually, the way I put it, we're just talking about getting out there and moving. Take the stairs instead of the elevator sometime. Don't circle around that grocery store parking lot trying to get that number one spot. Go ahead and park as far away as you can and get some extra walking in. I work just up the street here in one of the state buildings, and I I took the opportunity to uh, walk the five blocks down here today, and I'll be walking back, of course. As far as the river region... Uphill. uphill. It'll, it will be back <laughs> up, uphill. We'll be talking about uphill in just a second. Um, our three river region runners is happy to promote uh, fitness uh, by running, and again, by walking. You don't have to run. You can walk. I was talking to Lee about that. He's a big walker now. Um, but... River Region Runners, uh, we, we also play a role in the community um, by supporting uh, various charities uh, in and around the area. Uh, in fact, uh, in 2014, R3 contributed a total of $5,000 to 12 different charities in the area. And among those were the Family Guidance Center, the Children's Center, the Family Sunshine Center, Salvation Army, and uh, all three area uh, humane shelters. Now, for the uh, big event we have coming up, this is the signature event of the River Region Runners. It is the R3 Labor Day Run, and that involves an 8K and a two mile. So, and, and the mayor was asking me before, what's, what's an 8K? Well, it's not eight miles, I'll tell you that. 
eight kilometers, and it's just short of uh, five miles. It's about like 4.96. How that came about, I don't know. There's also five-mile runs, but this is an 8K. And um, a tie-in to um, my role with Roadrunners Club of America before I was elected the Southern Region Director for Roadrunners Club, I was the state representative for Alabama for Roadrunners Club for the previous 11 years. And one of the fun things I got to do was designate these championships uh, all across the state. Uh, various clubs would put in bids for a distance to be a championship. And uh, I didn't just hand it to uh, my local club because I'm tied with the local club. They did put in a bid. And uh, that, that's how they were selected uh, this year for the um, Roadrunners Club of America, Alabama RRCA uh, State Championship. And it is Labor Day, not the Saturday before. It'll be September 7th, uh, from, starts at the train station, and uh, you were talking about hills. Yeah. You hit the hills right away. <laughs> uh, you, you'll be going up... Uh, 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 by the alley on the Dreamland side and uh, up by the rail yard and up that hill towards the police station and uh, then you have a little downhill but you're going uphill by the cemetery before you get into the uh, Capitol Heights area. But there is a reprieve mayor. You'll work your way around uh, the uh, other side of the Capitol coming down Bainbridge and that uh, what I call the glorious stretch down Dexter. I love running down Dexter, and especially with all the improvements yeah. uh, the city has done. Uh, and um, you'll work your way around the fountain, uh, past uh, the uh, Rosa Parks uh, Museum and the Davis Theater, and work your way uh, back to the train station. And it uh, does start um, bright and early. That 8K uh, is at 7.30. The two mile is uh, at 8.30. And, um, we invite everyone to come celebrate Labor Day in a fit kind of way, starting early. And there will be just a ton of prizes. I can guarantee that because that's one of my areas as promotion coordinator. And Mayor, you, 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 well, you would believe, probably, the outpouring of businesses when, when I ask for a prize. We will have tons of big prizes from a lot of the uh, uh, businesses around Montgomery. And um, just hope uh, you'll join us. And uh, just to show, Mayor, that the White House championship ceremonies have nothing on Montgomery, I have something very special for you. This is the official shirt ah. for the R3 Labor Day run. I just picked them up on Monday, and this was the first one out of the box. So I would like, on behalf of the River Region Runners, to present this to ah, you. Ah, thank you. And How about that? That's not the only thing. Since, since we couldn't Oh, put, I got the bib? Oh, boy! You get the official <laughs> number one bib for, for our River Region uh, Runners Labor Day. Right? And he knows this is only ceremonial because I'm not going to be going up there. Thank you. I appreciate thank that. Thank you very much. Thank Could we take you. a picture? Yeah, okay. yeah. We're going to get a picture here real quick. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to close on a here go Ron. Uh, close on a. This is a, this is really for the media because we need your help. Media, we need your help. We need everybody's help uh, in in this community. You know, we had an election on Tuesday, and 32 percent of our registered voters voted, but we had. A more significant vote uh, a year or so ago, a year and a half ago, when we all went to the polls early and often, and we won through voting the Best Historic City Award. And we have marketed the heck out of that, and it's led us to all great uh, things on occupancy and revenues along the way. Then uh, we followed that up uh, with uh, trying to be voted the best uh, team name in minor league baseball, and the Biscuits won that one. 
as well. So we got a pretty good track record going. Then we had the third one that I remembered, Don, was the um, historic sites and uh, Martin Luther King home. Uh, we, we didn't finish first uh, on that, but we did fin uh, finish in the top 10 or top five. I don't remember. Yeah, number eight there. Well, we have another opportunity that's in process right now of voting early and often. And it's not something that's been uh, well publicized, but Don Hathcock, Don, if you would come up, really is the one that promotes voting early and often through the Chamber of Commerce because she's in charge of the business and uh, uh, convention and business bureau. But uh, there is a top 10 best historic designations for history buffs. And uh, we, we are right now in number three spot having fallen from number two, and we need to get uh, some votes. And we need the media, if they would, to promote this in some shape, form, or fashion. So tell them when it starts and, I mean, when it stops and how you, how you can vote and all that kind of good stuff. Good. Thanks, Don. Well, this is one of those things that we, we did have another election going on, so things were kind of diverted for a little while, and we were glad to do that. But now that we've got that one out under our belt, we really want to push this. We've got 18 days left. We're number three behind Gettysburg and Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. So those are, it's tough competition. It's really tough competition, but we pulled it out before. So we're really hopeful. Um, this is one of those things a couple of years ago, like the mayor said, we kept seeing different people on all these best of lists. And we were like, we need to get our name out there. So we really worked. And USA Today, we've worked very closely with them, got them down here to show them what all we have. And it's amazing. So you have until September 14th at 10.59 a.m. Central Time to vote. And I promise you, we push it to the very last second. Yeah, we won the, the, one of those in the last two minutes. We did. There was one, and they take it down at the very end so you don't know where you are. And we knew we were bouncing back and forth between first and second. We were actually sitting in this room. Yeah. For another meeting and I got the text so it was it was great news but you can go to www.10 the number 10 best.com and then go to readers choice awards and you'll see the categories and you just click on the uh, best destination for history buffs and please vote you can vote from iPad iPhone computers tablets Anything you've got, you can vote multiple times a day on different devices. So that's something to be important to think about. You can do it at your desk, on your phone. I actually did it at a stoplight on the way. I, I was stopped at a light. Were you in park? <laughs> I was in, well, <laughs> close. <laughs> close. Oh, <sir>. oh, <laughs> close. <laughs> but it, it really takes just a second to do it. So please remember. Media, we need your help on that one. We really, really, really do. It'd be great to, to do this year. Uh, to win that one as well. The last item on the agenda is another one that we need the media help with, and we need all of Central Alabama, as a matter of fact, all of Alabama's help. We've had Biscuits baseball here for, what, 11? Is this our 10th season, 11th season? Oh, 13th. Gosh, time flies when you're having fun. Well, this is lucky 13 then. This is lucky 13. Very seldom... Are we getting any media hype about what's happened with the Biscuits over the last 19 games? The Biscuits have won 16 of the last 19 games, and we're now four and a half games ahead in our division. Chattanooga won the first half. If we win the second half, which sort of like at quarter to nine Tuesday night, you know, God, how can we lose? <laughs> If, but if we win, we'll have another opportunity to continue playing baseball. And we only have 25 or 2,600 people in the stands. And I understand there are tons of things going on in Montgomery, Alabama. We may be our own worst enemy as it relates there. But we've got something significant going on with the business, uh, biscuits. And we need to vote with our attendance. Now, we've got a chance tonight. It's college night, rally in the alley, military night. We, we need to have five or 6,000 people there tonight. And then on the 2nd of September, the, Bis uh, the Barons, the Birmingham Barons, a great inner city rivalry who, frankly, by the way, 
we were in another contest to have the best stadium in minor league baseball, or was it double A? It's one of those two. Well, we got beat out by about six or 700 votes by Birmingham. Of course, they had a brand new stadium, but this is our opportunity because if we got a five game set, we're four and a half games. If we lose them all, we lose. If we just win one or two, we can be in the playoff. And so what I'm asking all of Central Alabama, anybody that can hear the sound of this voice, let's support the Biscuits. Let's come out on tonight, the 27th, and then the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th, I guess. So it's a five-game five stand, right? You got anything you want to add to this? I'm serious. This is not about filling up downtown Montgomery. This is not about filling our restaurants. This is not about anything but supporting the Biscuits and show that we care the Biscuits and cheer them on to victory. Because if that happens, we get a little more baseball in Montgomery, Alabama. And if we get more baseball in Montgomery, Alabama, that means that our economy is going to be a lot better. And so I close on a positive note. Go Biscuits. Go to the game. Vote with your attendance to show the Montgomery Biscuits that Montgomery cares about them and we can beat the Barons and win the second half division. So with that, it's been a good week, guys. Thanks. Appreciate it.